Good evening, SHIP Familia. I'm Esther Gonzalez, SHIP Scholarship Program Manager, and I am happy to be here with you today for our Latin X Factor webinar, the Job Seekers Toolkit. We look forward with providing you a job searching toolkit to enter and advance in your career. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Joshua Pasco from Honeywell. He is new to the SHIP Familia and attended NILA for the first time this August. We are so excited to hear from his expertise. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Joshua. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Um, I do have some slides to talk about uh, the Job Seekers Toolkit, you know, what, what sort of uh, best practices in resume writing, leveraging social media, and I definitely welcome questions at the end. Uh, there'll be time to, to answer any questions you might have. Just a little bit about myself. Um, I am uh, originally from Canada. I've now been in the U.S. for about 20 years. I've been with Honeywell um, for since uh, the year 2000. I started in New Jersey, worked my way down the down south, uh, ending up in Louisiana, and then moved across the country and have now been in Arizona for a number of years. Um, my role is I'm the, the VP of Talent Acquisition, which is the staffing leader for our aerospace business. So I oversee hiring or internship program, executive recruiting, inclusion diversity. I'm new to this role for about the last year. Uh, prior to that, I worked in HR and led our data and analytics organization. So you'll see as I talk tonight, I, I like data, I like numbers. A little bit just kind of my, my career and how I sort of ended up with Honeywell. I started as a summer intern, um, really enjoyed the assignment, uh, had some meaningful work, and then really stayed because I've been able to have four different careers with Honeywell. I've, been, I've worked in a chemical business, I've worked in an aerospace business, I've led an analytics function, um, and now I'm in a staffing role. So it's, it's been, uh, with the same company, been able to have a lot of great learning and opportunity. I've been uh, fortunate to travel the world. I think I've, when I've counted, I've been to about 15 countries with Honeywell. Uh, where we do business, um, and I, I really do enjoy the work and, and like being challenged. Um, and as you can see, sort of a, I'm newer to, to working with SHIP, but I'm very excited to, to, be with, to be partnering with this organization. Tonight's discussion is really about resume writing, uh, leveraging social media like, like LinkedIn, and really sort of my perspective and best practices in terms of how to get yourself ready for a job. And really the, the resume, and LinkedIn are sort of those entry points. We'll start with a quick poll. Uh, this just helps me know uh, who's in the audience. Uh, are you a university student, sort of undergraduate? Or are you a graduate student? Or are you a uh, professional with, with uh, either one to three or three plus years of experience? Thank you, Joshua. And the poll is now live and we'll go ahead and leave it open for about one minute. Ten more seconds here, please cast your vote. And the poll is now closed. Thank you for your responses. Are we able to see the results? What about this? Okay. Um, so as part of what I was thinking about as I was preparing this presentation was, over the last 20 years, in really all of my different roles in human resources, I've been an interviewer. Whether that's as a direct hiring manager, um, right now I have a small team. My last role, I, I had an organization of close to 100 people working for me. Whether that's as an HR generalist, um, supporting a manufacturing site, supporting a sales group, supporting an engineering group, and I've been I was helping the managers uh, conduct interviews. Um, and it's really an Obviously, my current role is the, is the staffing leader for aerospace. I, I do a lot of interviews. And I really interview people at all levels of the organization. Um, I've been active in university recruiting for a number of years, um, either going on campus or uh, interviewing people for uh, who are just graduating. 
I, I also right now in my current role will interview executives, people with 20, 25 years experience that are looking for a senior role, whether that's in engineering or finance. And as I was preparing this presentation, I thought to myself, so what do I look for? What, you know, you get a one, two, three page piece of paper um, highlighting someone's career. You know, how, how do I decide first, do I want to interview this person? Um, and then what makes them really stand out to me? So I thought I'd start with sort of the answer to that question, and then I'll back into some more specific details. But I want to kind of share my thoughts as you uh, work on preparing resumes, work on your LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile. One, I'm a fan of results. You know, when you, when you look at people, people, their resume, their LinkedIn profiles, there's a lot of, there's often this desire to use a lot of buzzwords, um, list out software that you might know, um, industry terms. But what really makes people stand out to me is when I look at their job experience, when I look at their extracurricular activities, and I see the results tied to it. You know, it demonstrates to me that it wasn't just that they were a participant, they were actively involved, they were uh, driving results and, and getting and making an impact. Um, second, and I'll, I'll share some more examples of this as we go through, simple, easy to follow resume. There's often a desire to be potentially overly creative, colors, pictures, charts. The resume is a, is a short document that helps me look at your education, look at your work experience, look at your skills, determine if I want to interview you, uh, helps me, guide me on questions. If, if it's very complex, if it's uh, hard to follow, if I'm bouncing between experiences, uh, work experiences and skills, and I can't find your education on it, it makes it very hard to identify which candidates that I want to talk with. So simple, easy to follow resume. Um, examples of leadership, and this is really in all areas of, of the resume, whether it's in the objective, your work experience, your education experience, um, your extracurricular, uh, volunteer work, do you demonstrate that ability to, to be a leader? You oversaw projects, you drove results, you were vice president, treasurer, president, but demonstrating some different levels of leadership in the different areas. The fourth, um, you know, particularly as we'll talk about social media as we go through this, have you taken time to learn about my company? So I work for Honeywell, we're a Fortune 100 company. It's very easy to find information on the internet about us. Um, depending on where, what school you went to, you might be able to find um, you know, uh, alumni who've got, who work with Honeywell, have gone to your school, but are you prepared to talk about kind of Honeywell, the types of jobs we have, the industries that we're in? It demonstrates that little extra that you are interested in, in my company. This isn't just a, you know, it doesn't feel like you've just sent out 100 resumes and are looking to talk to anybody. And then I particularly just want to call out for, for this population, there is more to academics. You know, we, we clearly are looking that people have an undergraduate degree. Um, it's great if you're working on a, a graduate degree. Uh, GPAs are good to, to share um, if they send a good story, but we are looking for more than that. As you're in doing your undergraduate program, are you volunteering anywhere? Are you part of any com committees? Are you part of any organizations like SHIP? Um, and just, it demonstrates that it goes back a little bit to the leadership. It goes back to having a broader skill set. So I just wanted to kind of highlight a few. And we'll, we'll talk more about these as I go through the presentation, but I look at a lot of resumes. I interview a lot of candidates. Um, I have a lot of uh, requests on LinkedIn uh, for contacts. I just wanted to kind of highlight a few of the areas that really make people stand out when you really only have a, a limited interaction. The resume, that formal document that is your, the summary of who you are and really why I should hire you. These are just some, some, uh, some tips as you're, as you're writing up your resume. Clear and concise action verbs. Goes back a little bit to the results on the, what I'm looking for in a candidate, but something that's you know clear i can understand what you accomplished um often there's people take are, are careful not to brag too much you don't want to show off uh it, it's good to be humble all except when you're writing a resume 
being humble, not showing off, not bragging. This isn't the time for those those traits. You need to sell yourself in this uh, in this one page document. So so do highlight um, things like GPA if it's good. Highlight uh, accomplishments. Highlight results. So really, you know, make sure to to, to demonstrate why you do stand out. Um, GPA is optional, um, but if it makes you look better, include it. That goes back to the prior point about um, highlighting your accomplishments. I really highlighted the next point in green. It'll come up a few times. Print out your resume, proofread it yourself, then have someone else proofread it. And then maybe even have someone else proofread it. Um, and it's gonna seem a little bit petty. Everyone makes mistakes. I do. If you, if, when I look back on emails that I've sent to people and you see my, I have spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, every once in a while there's a sentence you can't understand. That happens and in general day to day, that's okay. But this is your one chance to impress a company, impress an interviewer, um, get your foot in the door. This is not the time to have spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, um, sentences that don't make sense. So I really, really stress um, taking the time to have extra set of eyes. Um, one of the things I've learned over the years are, as I've made my own personal mistakes, if I've worked on something for an hour and then I go back and look at it, I, I sometimes lose the ability to, to see the errors and the mistakes. But if you have someone else take a look, they're often very good at finding those errors. So really do just take time to proofread. I mentioned on the prior page kind of what I look for, use numbers, data, emphasize results. I think that's critical clean formatting. And then the last area on this page is really around a cover letter. Um, this is something that's not as prevalent as it used to be. Um, I think there's still a time and a place for a cover letter. If you're sending a, an email to uh, a contact that you've been given, um, if you're handing this in at a, at a conference potentially, do you know who the, the person is? I think it's nice to have a short cover letter that uh, highlight aligns to a job that you're looking for, demonstrates again that you've you've researched the company, indicates if you have any uh, contacts at the company. So I think there is a time and place for a simple cover letter um, when you're maybe emailing and things like that. I don't think necessarily that cover letters are required if you're submitting a job online and you don't know who the um, the interviewer is. At that point, as the as the recipient, I'm really looking for the resume and not reading as much the cover letter. But I do think there's a time and place for cover letter, and I do think um, uh, making sure it aligns to the job is important. One question I do get asked is, you know, do you need a resume for every job that you apply, for every company you submit your resume to, or is one sort of standard resume effective? I think one standard resume is generally effective. Um, I think the more you make a lot of changes and you change for one job and you add in a word here or you take out a word there i think it runs the risk of making mistakes not having the formatting look as clean so i i recommend generally having one nice standard resume that you can use if you're trying to go into a different career you're applying for a job outside the norm of, of what your experience has been that may be the case to to change up your resume but in general i think having one standard resume makes a lot of sense The good, the bad, and the ugly. And these are by no means comprehensive, but I did want to just highlight some of the things that I've, these are examples, but these are things I've noticed over the years. Um, and really, um, you know, the, the second and third, the bad and the ugly, they really do make resumes stand out, but not in a positive way. Look at the ugly. Um, I assume I'm generally talking to engineers tonight. There's really no reason for colors and patterns in your resume. Nice, simple formatting works well. Um, the bottom right, pictures, not really necessary. Charts, graphs, generally not necessary. Um, it, it tends to be confusing. If I have to struggle to understand what a pie chart means, that's probably not a good, uh, a good first impression. Um, some examples of the bad. Um, you know, the top example, it may actually be very well written, but it's really hard to go through a, a paragraph that detailed. Resumes are a great way to use bullet points. And one, maybe two lines, you should be able to summarize your 
your key points. Uh, most most recruiters, most hiring managers, most staffing people don't really have the patience to read through a large paragraph. I'll talk about this a little bit later as we talk about social media. Whatever email address you have for personal use is great. That's no problem. When you're if you're starting to submit resumes, you're starting to have LinkedIn profiles, have a simple um, normal type of email address. Basketball dude is fine for your friends, whatever it may be. Again, there's there's no concern or issue what people do outside of this professional space, but in the in the the professional space, have a standard Joshua.pasco type email, something that's very simple. References. I don't think you need to say references available on request. We know that. We'll ask that. I think that's a legacy thing that people used to put in. Um, sometimes it's still used. Uh, the next point is around hobbies. I think everyone should have hobbies. I think that's good. If we hire you, we're interested in learning what your hobbies are. I don't really think it has a place on a resume. Um, you know, I think the resume is the opportunity to show really that business commitment. So I don't. I don't generally think hobbies are necessary on a resume. Um, if you want, if you choose to include them, that's fine. I don't think doing stuff really sort of silly like chili dog eating contests is is necessarily gives that professional look. But but again, this is this is my feedback in terms of what makes sense on a resume. Uh, but I found the last one really funny as I was looking for examples of uh, of proofreading um, skills, strong work ethic, work ethic, attention to detail, team player, self motivated attention to detail. They have such good attention to detail, but they repeated themselves twice in the one sentence. Really making sure you proofread, making sure that there's no mistakes. The left hand side with the good. I'm not advocating that this is the only format that you can use, that it has to be objective first, then education, then academic experience. But I did want to just highlight the simple look of this. There's bullet points. No bullet point is more than two sentences. I can easily see the topics, the objective, the education, the uh, work experience. I see competencies spelled out. There's dates that are clean. Um, you know, it's it's a a simple objective that tells me why you're looking for a job. There's a lot of different formats for resumes. Um, you know, some people put education first. I tend to see that for people that are earlier in career, where you might be looking for an internship, you might be just uh, looking for your first full-time job. That probably makes sense. If you have more experience, five or ten years in the workplace, it, oftentimes you'll drop your uh, education nearer to the bottom. I think that's fine. I don't think it matters as much whether education first or education is last. More just about a nice, clean, simple look for the resume. So, just kind of want to highlight some some examples. Some of these are kind of silly. I don't think any anyone on this call has flowers on their resume, but we do see sometimes where people um, try to stand out a little bit too much, and they do either silly charts, pictures, and things like that, which which really um, doesn't help the resume. And then kind of my last slide, I think I've hit on a number of these, but just some quick resume tips. The resume really is critical. So as you are looking for an internship this summer, as you're looking for a full-time job to graduate, um, if you're early career and you might be looking to, to make a job move, you're uh, applying for a job internal to your own company, you know, the resume really is that first impression uh, that a lot of recruiters will get, the hiring manager may get. So I do think it's important to make sure uh, you make a good impression and it's a nice, clean uh, resume. So resume tips, proofread, 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 but just make sure you go through and really have a clean resume. I've talked about the results. Spell out acronyms. Um, and we're really bad at this at Honeywell. We have three-letter acronyms for almost everything. Um, but if you don't work at Honeywell, those aren't going to resonate to you. Um, so I think it's important to remember, um, and that could be in your education. I don't know short forms for the the classes you might be taking or the software you might be using. So just make sure to spell out things. Uh, I, I know I said on the last page, but the clean, simple formatting, being concise. Um, I've had a boss that's explained to me many times over the years. Bullet points are meant to be short, short sentences. If you go 
Uh, her preference is you never go more than one line. I think it's okay sometimes to be on the second line for a bullet point, but really have a short bullet point, be concise. Um, and, I, and it's the bottom point here, but I don't want to, uh, to gloss over it, be factual. Um, this is really for two really, really, really important reasons. First, if I read a resume and I think that there's just no chance that it's true, I'm not likely to, to want to interview you. Um, and I've seen the occasional examples where people will put results that just clearly couldn't have happened. Uh, you know, projects had saved $25 million and you look at this project, you think that doesn't make sense. Um, but secondly, and, and really important, most companies, this is, Honeywell's not alone with this, um, there will be a background check. We'll validate education. We might validate prior work experience. And we'll look for things like what years you said you worked for the company, what year did you graduate, did you graduate, and if you, you might get through the interview if you exaggerate on your resume, but you have a very good chance of getting caught during that background check. Um, and you know, don't I don't want to to belabor the point here, but you know, in my experience, I have seen people that have indicated, you know, they've got a graduate degree. Okay, that looks good. We we like that probably wasn't a requirement for the job, makes them stand out. Then we do a background check and it says there's no degree. And then they come back and explain, well, we I did the graduate studies, but I'm three credits short or six credits short. Those aren't the same things. And, and it normally doesn't work out well for candidates when, when we find that there's um, an exaggeration or something wasn't factual. So um, just something to keep in mind uh, is, is keeping it balanced as you add in, as you want to brag about yourself, but it, it does have to be factual. On the right hand side, no pictures, no elaborate fonts and charts. Um, part of this is just a practical IT issue. You may end up downloading your resume into uh, what we call an applicant tracking system. Most companies use a system to collect resumes. If you use a lot of fancy fonts, would you enter it into our system? Sometimes the formatting gets messed up. So when, when I'm the hiring manager and it comes to me, if you did something too elaborate, I may not be able to read the charts and the graphs. Um, so uh, it's just something to keep out not doing the, uh, elaborate fonts. As I mentioned prior, you can leave out the personal interests. Um, there's a time and place for that, but not generally the resume. And then my general advice, and I think this probably covers most people on the call, if you're early career, you're looking for an internship, you're looking for a full-time hire because you're graduating, uh, congratulations, that's that's great, but you're looking for your that full-time job. If you're in your first job and you, you maybe only have one to two years of experience, I really do think a one-page resume makes sense. The I think that gets to the ability to be concise, the ability to um, just hit on your, your main points. There's always exceptions, so I don't want to I don't want anyone to, to think that it's it's mandatory you have one page. Uh, some people might have done more uh, education or research and have things they need to highlight there. So this isn't a, a, a hard and fast rule that you have to be on one page and, um, and it's a problem if you're not. But for the most part, as we look at early career resumes, we'd expect one page. If it gets much longer than that, in most cases, I feel like the candidate wasn't concise, didn't do a good job of, of getting to the point. So I just kind of wanted to highlight this first section, you know, some do's and don'ts of writing a good resume. It really is that first, of, oftentimes, not always, but often that first impression I have as a hiring manager. So it really is important to, to make that a nice clean document. I want to sort of transition now from the formal resume, which I talked about, to uh, leveraging social media. And a lot of what I'll talk about is LinkedIn, there are some other uh, websites, so I don't exclusively mean to, to focus on LinkedIn, but, but a lot of this applies to LinkedIn. Sometimes people confuse the two, and you know, I've, I've seen it referred to as LinkedIn as your, your virtual resume. Um, they're, they're similar. They're both great tools, the resume and LinkedIn, to help find a job, but I do want to highlight that there are differences. Uh, the resume really is that formal document um, that we store in our staffing system, 
you're applying to a specific job usually with the resume. I look at it as a hiring manager. I look at 10 resumes. I decide which three people to interview. It's clear, it's simple, it's a factual document that I leverage to, to decide who to interview. LinkedIn is has, a, has an element of that. Clearly, it's a place where you highlight your experiences, um, the companies you've worked for and stuff like that. But LinkedIn is really more of, of, obviously, from a social media perspective, not surprising, it's that social interaction. It's where you make professional contacts, you introduce yourself to people. Um, this is where, you know, I, in, in the resume I talked about not really having personal interests, being very factual. LinkedIn's a place where you can show more of that, of your interests, um, which companies you follow, which area, you know, what, what things are of interest to you, um, you know, from a personal perspective. It's a great place you can share stories, you can follow relevant groups. Um, so I can see, you know, as you're putting together your LinkedIn page, you know, follow companies that you're interested in finding a job with follow organizations that um, you think are important, whether that's voluntary, professional associations, things like that. Um, LinkedIn is very much in the open. Um, normally your resume you're sending to me in Honeywell, that one page document for that specific job. So I'm gonna take a look at it. LinkedIn is a place where any day a recruiter might uh, look to see your resume, uh, a peer might look to find information on you. So it's a much more open space and LinkedIn, you know, from I mentioned on the resumes, formal um, cover letters probably aren't as necessary anymore. LinkedIn is a place where the where short cover letters to introduce yourself is very much important. Um, so those are just just kind of want to highlight some differences before I jumped into LinkedIn. I'm going to assume uh, everyone on this uh, call knows what LinkedIn is. Uh, I would. I uh, have a polling question here just to see uh, which best describes the use of LinkedIn. So I just want to get your feedback. Is it a professional network? Is it a job board? Is it a place to follow other companies? Um, is it the place you highlight your career? So we'll open it up for a poll. Thank you, Joshua. And I did want to, um, before I open the poll for this question, I did want to share the results from the last question. Um, so it looks like half of our, oh, slightly over half of our participants are university students, about 7% are graduate students, and about 50%, um, I'm sorry, about approximately 40% are professionals and um, not too much difference between the early professionals and, and the mid-level professionals. So I did okay. want to share that with you and with the audience here. Um, and with that, we will go ahead and give me one second. Launch this second question. So we do invite you to participate. This poll is now live and we will keep it open for one minute. Over 70% of you have voted. Please cast your vote now. We will keep it open for about 10 more seconds. And the poll is now closed and we'll go ahead and share those results with you now. And it looks like over 70% of our audience believes it is all of the above. Um, and the second option that came in was the professional network to make contacts, which was 17%. Great. Yeah, no, thanks everyone for taking the poll. Just, um, it really is um, all of the above. I think the, the primary um, area for, for LinkedIn is that professional network, um, but, 
Uh, I know companies like Honeywell, we post our jobs there, uh, as do other companies. Um, it's a place to follow um, different companies, leaders. There's a lot of um, whether uh, company executives uh, that would share their thoughts and stuff and you can follow them. Um, so it really does cover all of these different areas. So the importance of LinkedIn. I'm not being paid by LinkedIn. I have no personal um, stake in LinkedIn. I do generally think it's a good platform nowadays for people to be on. There are others if you find, um, I know there's some that are very specific to software engineering, so there could be other um, uh, social media platforms, but I do think LinkedIn from a professional perspective is a really good platform. Um, it's a great place to see your virtual professional summary. I will often, if I have a, a candidate go, coming in, and if I'm uh, on the fence about trying to, if we're determining whether we want to interview them, take a quick look at their LinkedIn profile. It's a really good place to, to build a network um, and get exposure to the types of jobs that are out there. Um, and, uh, you know, practically, <laughs> I think I used myself as an example near the bottom, um, it's really one of the top results when you Google somebody. So it, it does have relevance in terms of uh, finding out information. So um, feel free to Google me or look, at me, uh, look me up on LinkedIn, but um, LinkedIn is really a, an important um, avenue for, for professionals nowadays. Your LinkedIn profile. Uh, you can take a look at my example on the left. I also uh, have a, um, this is a summer intern for Honeywell, someone I work with here in Phoenix this summer. Uh, she was gracious enough, Lauren, to let us use her profile. This is a little bit similar to some of the discussion I had on resume. I'm not advocating that these are the perfect profiles. By all means, um, you know, people can do what makes sense relative to them. But I do think, um, you know, some of the critical elements, uh, clear professional photo, you know, that's okay on Facebook if you have pictures of vacations, hanging out with friends, any of that type of stuff, not necessarily appropriate, not normally appropriate on LinkedIn, a simple, clear a photo. Um, Reflector, you know, where the resume was just that really formal document, I think it's okay to show more personality here. Tell me where you're from, follow different groups. Um, you know, and it's, there's nothing wrong with it. The, the Lauren from the uh, HR intern I work with, she's a fan of Walt Disney, so she follows the Walt Disney company. Nothing wrong with that. This is an okay place to, to have a little bit more of your personality come out. Um, headline your current role um, if you're employed, or what you are seeking to do. So in many cases, I think half of you are uh, students right now looking either for an internship, a full-time job, highlight that, you know, what you're looking for. So if I take a quick look, I understand your understand that. Update, job titles, career history, volunteer experience. So, you know, it should be relatively refreshed uh, to based on your experience. Um, and this, can, this is the place where you can highlight a little bit more of your, your education, your interest. So, um, you know, this, you can show a little bit more personality, follow more areas that are of interest to you. Um, you know, I chose, uh, in this case, and I, Lauren used the, the new Honeywell slogan, features what we make it, which is great. Um, I'm a baseball fan, the, so the one piece of personal information you'll be able to get off about me is, is the fact that I'm a baseball fan. Um, but, but LinkedIn is important to have that clean profile. Uh, there's also a pro tip about setting settings and privacy. Um, if you are looking for a job, there are a number of recruiters um, that that leverage LinkedIn profiles to try to find people that might be a good fit. So by all means, uh, make sure your profile shows that you're interested in, in finding a job. Uh, LinkedIn networking, um, leverage LinkedIn. I mean, I think that's the, the takeaway on the slide, right? Um, make connections, find people that you might be interested in. Um, when you are making a connection, um, you know, try to indicate why you're reaching out to that person. You've met them, you saw a presentation for them, you think their company is really important. Um, you know, be careful not to over message. Um, you know, you want to demonstrate interest in the company, you want to demonstrate interest in the people, your, your contacts. For the most part, people 
this isn't a full-time job, keep it up there, like did profiles and responding. So you don't never necessarily want to over message. Um, and then just, you know, create your own emails. I know it's a nice feature on LinkedIn that they can sometimes write out the simple response for you, that one liner, so you don't have to bother. It doesn't really show that you um, you took a lot of time to respond and that you're interested. So um, just think about how you leverage LinkedIn from a networking perspective. It is great. I do have people reach out to me all the time. I think it, that there's nothing wrong with that. It's a great way um, to get introduced to Honeywell. Uh, I am a staffing leader, so if people are interested in Honeywell, it makes sense to try to reach out to me. So, uh, But just make sure you kind of think about some of these tips. Um, these are just a couple of examples of really the virtual uh, cover letter. So really the introduction email from LinkedIn. Um, you know, the three that I didn't cross out, again, any one of these is fine and it's, it's a personal style, but it's, you know, the, the one on the top left, you know, is a software engineering position that is still open, um, you know, just letting me know they're interested in it. Great. They've obviously done some research in terms of the jobs. They're reaching out. Great. The middle one, um, you know, good. They want to introduce themselves. Oftentimes, we'll get 10, 20 resumes for a job. Nothing wrong with trying to make yourself a little bit more, uh, excuse me, make yourself stand out more, make me research you a little bit more. The third one is an example um, of someone looking for an internship. Um, they gave me details. You know, wasn't too long, three paragraphs. They highlighted you know, their success, they've got a good GPA. They demonstrated that they've looked at Honeywell, so they're telling me which positions specifically they've applied to. They've made it easy, they attached a resume. So any one of these is, is a good format, but they're all easy to follow, they're not too general. The two I crossed out as an example, the bottom left um, is, and it goes back to some of the discussion I mentioned on resumes, there are spelling mistakes including my name. <laughs> it may, it's not a standard name, but I do spell Pascal with an E at the end. Um, it's, it doesn't leave me with a great impression. It also is just too generic. Same as the top one in the middle, right? I'm looking for an internship and I'm very interested in your company. That doesn't make me feel like you're very interested in my company. It feels like you just did this to 50 other people. So, you know, take the time to spend, to research a little bit, um, demonstrate that you, uh, be a little bit more specific. Taking action on LinkedIn, um, subscribe to content feeds that are relevant to your interest, follow targeted companies. Many of you will be going to the SHIP National Convention in Phoenix, which is where I live. So uh, we welcome you to Phoenix in October. If you have interviews scheduled with five companies, tar um, follow those companies, learn a little bit about them before you come meet with us. Um, Show your LinkedIn comments, posts. Again, it just shows the topics you're interested in, uh, where you have insight. Um, it looks like you might be targeting and look and interested in specific companies. So all of that makes sense to share your feedback online. And then a couple of tips relevant specific to um, leveraging LinkedIn for searching a job. Um, LinkedIn does pull in a lot of jobs, including Honeywell. So this isn't a sales pitch, but uh, we do have our jobs posted on LinkedIn, as do many other companies. So it is a great place to see what's available. You can set up alerts for yourself. So if you like Honeywell, if you like General Electric, if you like Google, if you like Amazon, you can uh, set up an alert so you get told when certain jobs open up. And then just if you are starting to leverage LinkedIn more for you know searching for a job, making contacts, make sure your profile's up to date. So if you've been a bit of a passive user, for the last year or two, but now you're you're getting close to graduating or you're setting up for an, a summer internship, do make sure that your your uh, your profile is is the latest. And then I think my last uh, polling question: What do you think? Social media sites like LinkedIn have replaced the traditional resume for companies. We'll do a quick poll: True or false? Okay, and our poll is now live, so please go ahead and cast your vote where you have one minute left.
10 seconds left here. Okay, and the poll is now closed. Let's go ahead and see what y'all think. So over 80% of our audience here believes it's false. What do you think, Josh? I think it is false. Uh, so I tend to agree. So LinkedIn is a great place to highlight your, your work experience, education, follow other companies, but the resume still is critical in that you're actually interviewing, or excuse me, applying or interviewing for a job, it's the resume that's used. So it's kind of, it's really important as, as, you've, as I've tried to highlight today is both areas need to be kept up to date, kept um, looking professional. But there's still a, a resume, um, Honeywell's not alone, but pretty much every company, you have to apply formally for a job, submit your resume to the company. So uh, the answer on this one is false. My last slide on social media, uh, just some social media channel tips um, and some thoughts on this. Um, you know, the first uh, two are just around, um, you know, I've talked about LinkedIn because I think from a professional perspective, that's one of the most common. That's definitely not the only one. Um, a number of companies are on Instagram. You can follow companies on Twitter to hear what they're looking at. Um, so follow the accounts or the websites of, of things that you're interested in. Look for other professional groups. Um, there could be an organ, I think software engineering has uh, their own versions of LinkedIn. Others uh, over time will follow. So definitely use LinkedIn, but look for other groups and, and websites as well. So the next two points are just around, you know, social media and that balance between personal and professional. I'll give you a little bit of my feedback. Um, some people have a slightly different perspectives. Um, I can tell you kind of the official Honeywell policy as well. Um, absolutely, social media is great for personal use. Belong to whatever um, sites that you want to with friends, family, um, you know, uh, fellow students, all of them are fine. Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, all of those are fine. Do whatever you want on the on the social media. I, I would encourage people to keep personal and professional separate. Um, and that goes back a little bit to even the resume example. There's another, nothing wrong if your um, your personal email address is basketball dude at hotmail.com or gmail.com or whatever. When you're, when you're sending the resume to me, have it look professional. So I do generally encourage people, social media is great, do whatever you want from a personal perspective, but try not to mix the two too much. And then the next bullet is really just my, my word of advice. I don't look at people's Twitter accounts. I don't look at people's Facebook accounts when I hire. I've never done that. I don't think it's necessary. It's not a Honeywell policy to, I would think most companies probably agree with me. I can't speak for every company, but I think most people would agree that what people do on social media in their, in their personal life is their own business and, and we don't look at that sort of stuff. But it is a reminder that when you post something, it is visible. And it will often remain visible for five years or longer. Um, the two examples I've seen of this really aren't related as much to uh, getting a job, um, but um, one was uh, there was recently, at least I saw it on the news in Phoenix, there was some um, a student who had applied for and had been accepted to Harvard University. Uh, he had that acceptance rescinded because Harvard went back and saw um, what they deemed some inappropriate uh, posts on Twitter a few years ago. Um, there was also an example uh, I showed I'm a baseball fan on the prior slide uh, a couple slides ago. Uh, there was an example of um, a pitcher started doing really well, all of a sudden got famous, and then it became a big news story that five years earlier when he was a high school student, uh, he had posted some racist stuff on Twitter, um, and uh, you know he had to he, he was in the spotlight for the wrong reasons, had to apologize clearly, had to demonstrate kind of why he's, he's grown beyond that. I'm not any way trying to tell people they should or shouldn't use social media. I think people have 
the, the right to express any opinion they want. So I'm not in any way uh, trying to indicate and leave this on the, you, you, should, you shouldn't do stuff on the social media. It's just a reminder about um, what does happen in the real world if you're not careful. And then my last slide, um, you know, and definitely going to open this up for questions. We've got, uh, you know, 15 minutes uh, to answer any questions. You know, both the resume, social media are great platforms to introduce yourself to companies like Honeywell, introduce yourself to hiring managers, recruiters, uh, staffing leaders, um, create a personal brand. This is the time for you to shine. Tell me why I should hire you. Make it look professional. Um, focus on key companies and, and know about them. So particularly as you used uh, LinkedIn, uh, you know, focus your efforts, be factual, and then just, you know, leverage social media um, with a little bit of caution. So I'm really excited to have talked to the group today. Hopefully you found uh, some of these, these tips to be helpful. There's no one way to write a perfect resume, so I can't, I couldn't unfortunately tell you that here's the one page template template and if you use this you'll always get a job but I hope you, you picked up some uh, useful tips and I'm happy to open it up for questions now. Thank you so much Joshua. I think we've all learned quite a bit today about resumes and LinkedIn and how to market ourselves to companies. Uh, so I do want to let all of our audience know that you can go ahead and type out your questions in the questions box of the webinar and we will go ahead and start taking your questions. We have... And here is our first question. Do you think it's appropriate and professional to put an applicable personal project section on your resume? Um, I do think that that can be that can be appropriate um, if it demonstrates some of the leadership, if it demonstrates some of the either volunteer experience and things like that, um, or if it demonstrates like a really big project that you did. I think that can be appropriate. So um, yes, I, I think that's fine. Perfect. Thank you for that response. The next question, um, and I think you touched a little bit on this, Joshua, in your last slide, is what do you think is the best font size and best font for resumes? Um, I don't necessarily know about font. Times New Roman and Calibri seem to be very popular. Generally, about 12-point font makes sense. Um, if you go much bigger than that, it's hard to get enough information. If you go really below 12-point font, um, it sometimes becomes difficult to read. Um, I think you could use larger font for uh, some of the headers like job experience or education, definitely for your name, but generally 12 point font is good. Thank you for that response. Uh, we we did have uh, one person reach out and ask if there will be a link to watch this later due to connection issues. Um, yes, that there will be a link and that will be on our Latinx Factor webpage. Um, so if you go to programs.ship.org um, or you just Google ship Latinx Factor, um, you will see a recording of this posted um, within one business day. So we will do that. And we have another question here. One second. What is your opinion as Honeywell about religious, uh, religious beliefs in LinkedIn? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I. I think it's fine to follow um, organizations that that align with their religious beliefs. I don't, um, I don't see any issue with that. I think you're, you're following. Um, often people follow the places they went to school. They follow the companies they like. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with following stuff like that. Um, so I, I think it's fine. I think it, a little bit when you start to get more into the resume side, I think it's. Um, if it's if it's a volunteer experience, there's nothing wrong with that, but I wouldn't necessarily share any sort of personal beliefs on the resume side other than just keeping it professional. But on LinkedIn, I don't think there's any concern with that. Okay, thank you. Next question, 
In LinkedIn, I get requests from people I don't know personally on a daily basis. Some of them have several connections in common, SHIP for example, which I always accept, but others have one or two, never heard of them, or recruiters from X company or just random people. What do I do in those situations? I actually just ignore them. Um, you know, I if, if there's an introduction as to why they're reaching out to me, so in my space right now, I'm a staffing leader, I may get someone saying, you know, just want to reach out to you, Josh. Uh, we do recruiting in the Phoenix area. Uh, we do a lot of engineering. Let me know if you might be interested in talking. I might accept someone like that because I think it aligns with my, my professional needs. Uh, that it's someone I might want to know. But that's different than where I just get a connection where I don't know the person. They have a tenuous connection with someone that that I have a connection with, I tend to just ignore those ones. So I think it's my opinion is if it's if it's sort of relevant and you kind of understand why they're reaching out to you, great, make the connection. But I, I definitely don't accept all the connections that come to me. Sounds good. Um, our next question here: Would you recommend attaching your resume or your website link to your LinkedIn profile? Yes, I think that's a good idea. I think, um, you know, particularly if you're starting to leverage it now for summer internships, full-time jobs, things like that, I think having it available is can be helpful. Yes. So having having a resume link available or your or your website is is a good idea. Sounds good. We have a really good question here. Um, these are all great questions, uh, but having insider knowledge, I think, will be good for this one specifically. When being rejected for a job position, is there a way to know what they didn't like about us so that we can improve besides getting the polite response? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think there's there's a there's opportunity sometimes to get that additional feedback. Um, if you have the um the the name of the, the formal either hiring manager or like recruiter that you talked to um i think it's perfectly appropriate to send them a, a short email afterwards and saying you know thank you for the opportunity to read with honeywell um you know well i'm disappointed i i didn't get the job i really appreciated the experience to talk with you um if you're able to share a few things um about my my interview or my resume that as to why to get the job i'd really appreciate it it will help me uh, for my future endeavors i think you can send those type of of simple emails some will respond some won't but i don't think there's anything wrong with sort of politely asking for additional feedback i would just make it come across as this is just about learning and and you know being better for your next interview just so there's it doesn't come across as that there's any animosity but i think that's a great idea um, particularly if you're you haven't interviewed very much and it's you know, you're not sure as to kind of why, what you did or didn't do well. It's a good question. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, the next question, in your opinion, what is a good GPA to add on a resume? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, so I'll generally, I'll give my answer based off of a four scale. I know some, some people have different scales and you have to adjust. Um, I would probably say 3 to 3.2 would be something that I would, would highlight if you're at that level or above. Um, I don't know that there's a hard and fast, but I would generally say 3 to 3.2 starts to, to stand out. Okay. Sounds good. Um, the next question um, is specifically for our professionals. Um, and this question asks, I'm interested to know what you would think about a professional who has five plus years of experience and decides to go to grad school. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, someone who's had uh, work experience and then goes back to grad school after five years, I think that looks very good on resumes. I think, um, you know, as the person sells themselves and their resume and their interviews, they can really highlight as to how the graduate school either, you know, moves their career to potentially a slightly different focus area, um, helps them. Um, where I see this a lot is someone might have a, a general engineering degree, degree, excuse me, and then go back for more like an MBA, um, 
or something like that. So I think it looks good on people's resume. I don't, we never have really concerns about people going back. And I, I don't think there is a, I definitely don't think there's a specific time. Like I don't think you have to go back and do a graduate degree within three years or five years or eight years. I think it's really what makes sense for a career. And it, it is part of the ability to tell a story as to why it, it helps you move up to the next level. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the next question I think is unique to our, um, especially important to our audience um, and our members is, is Honeywell, or are Honeywell's job opportunities open just for U.S. citizens or um, are residents encouraged to apply and how would I find that information? Yes, I always love the opportunity to talk specifically about Honeywell jobs. Um, uh, most of our jobs are open to uh, residents of the United States. Um, we do have, uh, you know, the business I'm in is aerospace. So we do have portions of our aerospace business, for example, that are uh, in the defense space and you have to be a U.S. citizen. Um, most of our jobs would indicate if, if U.S. citizenship is required. And if they don't say that, then... Um, residency is fine. Um, Honeywell doesn't do a lot of sponsorship for people that need uh, work visas afterwards. We do have some places to do that. Um, we'll be, we generally will say if we're, if we're doing sponsorship, but um, in terms of residency, that's that's normally fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, the next question that we have is, do you advise making separate resumes for different industries? For example, research and the workforce. Yes, so I don't think you need to make separate resumes for every company you talk with or um, exactly every job that you're looking at. But if, if you're having, if you're sort of on the fence about going into, you know, your for example, in a graduate degree, and you're sort of deciding whether you want to go get a job with a, a you know a big company like Honeywell, or if you want to do more of a research professional type position, um, I do think having a separate resume that that highlights some of the differences makes sense because I think obviously um, in the research one you'd really highlight more of the classes you've taken and uh, the papers you've worked on. So. Um, I don't think I don't think people have generally a lot of different resumes, but I think in this case that would make sense. Thank you. Uh, next question here: uh, When working on resumes on the skill section, is it appropriate to include a skill that I am still learning, such as coding? I think it's appropriate if you're beyond sort of the basic level. So if if you're just sort of learning coding right now and you're taking a class or you've just been working on for three months, I I probably wouldn't highlight it there. But if you've done so enough, you've gone, you've done it for six months, you're you're sort of beyond that beginner level, I think it's okay to highlight it. Um, you just want to be careful that you're you're not sort of misleading about the extent. Um, that could be if you're if you're newer for skill like that, you could put, you know, um, uh, you know, intermediate or something like that to highlight that you're not necessarily fully proficient in it. I, but I think it's generally okay to highlight a new skill as long as you're sort of past that that first period of learning. And our last question here, um, we have one minute left, is how do you recommend discussing a challenge you faced as a first generation student? For example, the lack of traditional, of having a traditional internship. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, and I actually talked to a few students about this at the NILA conference. Um, when, when I'm looking at a resume for um, for students, people that are either applying for an internship or applying for their first uh, position, I'm not really expecting a ton of, um, of, of, of really relevant internship experiences. I know those can be very hard to get. Um, you know, particularly if you're a freshman right now, or if you're if you're a sophomore, um, having that really great um, internship can be hard. I I would offset it more with um, some of those other things that you've done. So um, where you've done volunteer, where you've led team projects, where you've um, worked at the school on um, 
on uh, research pro projects and stuff like that. So I, I, I get and, and I and I understand the challenge um, when, when you just haven't had the chance and it, it hasn't been easy to necessarily find that first internship. I would just really think about what have you, highlight the other things you've done. So highlight volunteer experience, highlight um, work at the school, highlight uh, research and stuff like that. So um, def definitely don't feel bad if you haven't had a great internship by the time you're a sophomore or a junior. Um, just take the, t the opportunity to tell, kind of tell me the other great stuff that you have done. Perfect. Thank you so much for that response, uh, Joshua. I do want to genuinely thank you from our SHIP Familia for taking the time to lead us in this very, very important uh, webinar today that I'm sure all of our members are very grateful for, um, especially at a time where we're transitioning applications from, you know, old school to new school with marketing ourselves digitally. This is very relevant information. Um, I do thank you for your time. I thank the audience for joining us today. Please um, feel free to share information about Latinx Factor and the excitement about next week's webinar as well. And I do want to let you all know, I know there was a few more questions, again, asking if this is being recorded and will be shared. And the answer is yes. Um, and that will be available by tomorrow. So thank you all for joining and we will go ahead and conclude this webinar now. Thank you. Thank you very much.